Okay, today we're going to discuss hemlock, Suga canadensis. So eastern hemlock um, is actually one of our, our, our biggest, longest living species here in our eastern forests. It's also the state tree of Pennsylvania. It's a really wonderful tree. Um, quite easy to identify. We have already done a tree talk identification of eastern hemlock in the past. Um, but uh, we'll look at it again here. Uh, so um, it has very soft needles. Um, it is a conifer and, and, an, and an evergreen. Um, uh, and so uh, to tell the difference between other conifers, again, we already did you know, a video on that, but hemlock will hold its needles um, uh, on either side of the stem. And you can also see there are young leaves that are kind of right sort of in the middle. To me, they kind of look like little sort of ski jumps off of the main stem, kind of uh, up vertical. Yeah, you might have to go sideways there to really see what I'm referring to there. Um, so those, those needles are quite easy to identify when you get up close, and they also, on the underside, very distinctively, have those two white lines on them. So that's a great way uh, to be able to identify hemlock. Um, they also have very distinctive cones that are really tiny. Tiny little cones, um, adorable tiny little cones. Um, and again, so these are uh, gymnosperms, they are conifers. Um, so they don't have fruit, they just bear seeds out of these cones. Um, the bark is also uh, pretty distinctive. It can be a little easy to mix it up with some other conifer species, but um, it has kind of a, a, a sort of a reddish, purplish kind of brown color, um, especially as it gets bigger. But these uh, vertical, streaks, these kind of XY patterns um, only develop, you know, over time. Uh, it gets kind of redder and purplier um, as the tree gets bigger. Um, so ecologically, super important tree. Culturally, super important tree. I mentioned it was the state tree of Pennsylvania. It is the state tree of Pennsylvania. Um, and it was really important uh, in the, the Appalachian region, where, of course, sort of northern Appalachian region, where it, uh, it calls home um, historically. It was primarily used not for uh, lumber necessarily, although locally it was certainly used a lot for lumber. It was actually used for its bark. Um, the bark was removed and then boiled down to tan leather, to dye wool, things like that. Um, now, however, uh, to, to, to kill the tree, just to use the top or the, the bottom, you know, 10, 15 feet of bark um, is, is uh, a little offensive to me, especially because this is such a cool tree and such a long living tree, an ecologically important tree. But, you know, uh, back at that point in time, people weren't really thinking, you know, like we do now about um, kind of the inherent value of nature necessarily, um, or even the longevity of how we were managing the land. Um, I hope that we kind of think a little bit more about stuff before we do things like that. Um, but so ecologically, this tree is actually one of the most shade tolerant species in the east. Um, it actually will not germinate in the open. Um, it really, really likes uh, to grow in the shade of its own um, uh, other hemlocks, but also of other species. Um, and so other species don't really do so well in the shade. There, there's not really that many species that will grow in sort of the complete darkness that you can find sometimes in hemlock woods. I mean, you barely see any sun because all year round you have this dense canopy um, of the hemlock. Um, but uh, so we don't have many old growth forests left in the east because they were, almost all forests were, uh, were cleared about 100 to you know, 150 years ago uh, in what we call the big cut. Um, but there are some remnant stands that were just so remote or so kind of hard to get to, um, uh, hard to extract uh, the trees from that the trees weren't cut. And hemlock is, is just going strong there. Huge, massive trees that are really beautiful and, and doing uh, really well germinating in their own shade there. Um, so when we kind of talk about this ecological principle of a climax of conditions of a forest, um, really in Pennsylvania, for a lot of Pennsylvania and a lot of the kind of central Appalachians, you know, when we had old growth forest still, uh, eastern hemlock was kind of really what we were talking about. On sites that were not really getting burned uh, frequently, that were not, um, that were not cleared, um, the hemlock would eventually slowly, slowly, slowly in the understory start to dominate and then just remain there, you know, supreme. Um, they, as far as their habitat goes, they're not going to grow out again in the drier, open places. They like the, the dark, damp places. So they are mostly found on uh, uh, darker aspects, on cooler aspects. So those would be north facing slopes and in habitats like this, where we have, 
uh, a little sort of ravine here um, and a stream. And so they are kind of associated with riparian uh, cover um, with these kind of uh, mountainside creeks um, because they will grow down here in this cove that's sheltered from the sun and from the heat. Um, these are the conditions that, you know, they kind of prefer, these more sort of northerly, cooler climates. Um, they have really shallow root systems, actually kind of notoriously shallow root systems um, that don't really care about all the rock uh, that they're growing in. And so the reason they're called hemlock is actually, uh, you may have heard of um, hemlock, the, the poisonous plant, and a lot of people remember the story of uh, Socrates uh, was, was sentenced to death by drinking a hemlock tea and that poisoned him. Um, that was actually the species, that hemlock, uh, which is a European annual plant, or biannual, biannual plant, um, but a, and a pest in Europe. Um, this tree was named after that, that pest weed in Europe because people back at the time um, would thought that the, the character, the in, inherent character of a species was reflected by either its growth form or the places it was growing. And hemlock is found in these nasty, shallow soils, wet soils, shallow soils, places that were not good for farming. And so those Europeans back then were, well, that must have a very poor moral char character as a plant if it grows in those terrible places. Um, and so let's name it after this terrible plant back in Europe. And so that's why it's named hemlock. Um, it's named after a terrible plant <laughs> uh, in Europe and, and now an invasive plant here in North America. Uh, but, you know, what a lovely, wonderful uh, species uh, here in the, in the eastern U.S. So, talked about some of the timber value there. Um, ecologically, not only is it really important as a, a potential climax species if we allow forests to reach that old growth condition, um, especially in their, you know, cove habitats uh, where they're found, um, but it's also really, really important. Um, there are a lot of bird species uh, that are relying on the cover provided by, and other wildlife species rely on the, the cover um, of eastern hemlock. Um, but also on the uh, food supported by hemlock. So all these hemlock leaves, these needles, are being you know, eaten uh, by various insects. Those insects are being eaten by other species. So really important um, member of our, uh, our, our mountain forest systems. Now, speaking of insects, I have some bad news while we kind of lovingly talk about this lovely tree. Um, it is declining. Um, it is really uh, having a lot of trouble um, countering the hemlock woolly adelgid which is an introduced insect um, that basically, once it, uh, an infection happens, it will start, they, they, they drink fluids from the leaf tissue. Um, so they won't kill the tree at first, for a while, until the infections get kind of worse and worse and worse. Uh, eventually they will kill the tree, especially in the southern reaches of, uh, of the, the hemlocks range, kind of the, the, the southern Appalachians. Um, now that the adelgid has been there for a couple decades. There's a lot of hemlock stands that are just completely, you know, gone. Um, and so, especially for such a tree that lives a really long time, um, such an important tree uh, culturally, and, and such a kind of, you know, mountain mountain proud <laughs> tree, um, it's really kind of heartbreaking to see it uh, uh, getting wiped out by this introduced pest. Um, the hemlock woolly adelgid is susceptible to super, super, super cold temperatures, so it can be kind of kept in check um, by really cold winters. However, we're having less really cold winters. And again, that the southern range, it, it's suffering more and more. As the climate continues to change, it's likely that the adelgid is gonna start winning more and more and more, and we're gonna be losing our hemlock. Now, tiny little glimmer of hope. Um, I, I've read that back, uh, they think about uh, 8,000, 10,000, 12,000 years ago, somewhere in there, there was a genetic bottleneck with hemlock that it survived. So there was some pest that hit it really hard, you know, back then, um, and it was able to make it through. So maybe, uh, maybe our lovely Eastern hemlock will make it through. Uh, I really hope so, it's a really great tree.